Murdo Sound is about 40 miles long and is approximately 40 miles wide. At a point about midway down the Sound, with Ross Island to the east and the mainland to the west, the Sound narrows to approximately 32 miles and then almost immediately widens again to its 40 mile width and continues at this approximate width until terminating at the ice shelf. In the month of November, the winter ice cover of McMurdo Sound is in the course of being broken up into pack ice, and at the time of year, the breakup process has proceeded as far south as about the entrance to the Sound. Therefore, the approach by air to McMurdo area, flying south from New Zealand in November of any year, will be over the water of the Ross Sea, and over areas of pack ice interlaced with sea water, and then as the approach to the sound is reached, the aircraft will thereafter be flying down the sound over solid ice. The ordinary military route used by aircraft of the United States Navy, the Royal Australian Air Force and the Royal New Zealand Air Force, proceeds down the centre of McMurdo Sound and then, as the head of the sound is drawing near, the descending aircraft will turn left so as to line up with the approach across the ice shelf to the landing field. As the aircraft flies over the Ross Sea, with McMurdo Sound in the distance, air crew will see on the right the long vista of Victoria Land, with its range of mountains extending far away to the south, beyond the limit of human vision. Forward of the aircraft and to the left will be observed the distinctive outline of Ross Island, dominated by Mount Erebus, rising from its crater at its peak, a permanent plume of steam. There are three other mountains on the island, but the others do not approach in altitude the 12,450 foot height of Mount Erebus itself. As the aircraft enters the sound, and if one assumes it's flying down the centre of the sound, an air crew will see on their left the 5,380 foot peak of Mount Bird, 22 miles to the left. Then, as the aircraft flies on and reaches a point approximately halfway down the sound, it will find itself abeam Mount Erebus, with its peak some 27 miles to the left of the aircraft. During this flight path down the sound, the mountains of Victoria Land on the right will be between 25 to 30 miles away. With such a definitive and geographically striking landscape as just described, punctuated by significant and apparently unmissable landmarks, how would it be possible that Collins and all of those on the flight deck of the DC-10 that afternoon had managed to do exactly that, particularly in light of the fact that the accepted truth by all concerned was that visibility at the time was to all intent and purpose unrestricted. This chapter will introduce some of the unique challenges aviators can experience while flying in these remote parts of the globe, phenomena which unless personally experienced are often difficult to imagine and comprehend, yet have the potential to render even the most experienced of pilots defenceless without a thorough knowledge of their existence and a developed awareness of what the associated warning signs usually look like. This is an insight into the fragility of human perception, a fundamental weakness of our collective physiology, where our understanding of the external world is often modelled more by our expectations of what should be visible rather than what we actually see as being visual. This is the story of Whiteout. The term whiteout has more than one meaning as being descriptive of weather conditions and snow-covered terrain. For aviation purposes, it is often described as the cause of the visual difficulty which occurs when an aircraft is attempting to land during a snowstorm. To this day, the United States Navy maintains a special whiteout landing area situated to the south of its normal landing strip near McMurdo Station. This area is used when an aircraft which is committed to land is required to land when visibility is obscured by a snowstorm. The snow in Antarctica is perfectly dry, and a wind of only about 10 knots can sweep loose snow off the surface and fill the air with these fine white particles. A landing on the special whiteout landing field can be accomplished only by an aircraft equipped with skis, or in the case of an aircraft without skis, with the landing gear retracted. Flying in a whiteout of that description is no different from flying in thick cloud. The pilot cannot know where he is and must land in accordance with strict radio and radar directions. What became apparent to Mahan during the course of his investigation 
was that neither the airline nor the Civil Aviation Division ever understood the term whiteout to mean anything other than a snowstorm, and thus formulated the opinion that they were never aware until they read the Chief Inspector's report of the type of whiteout which occurs in clear air in calm conditions and which he believed most probably ultimately afflicted Collins and his crew. The Chief Inspector looked carefully into this variety of whiteout because as his inquiry proceeded it became apparent that although the aircraft was flying in clear air not one of the five persons on the flight deck ever saw the mountainside with which the aircraft collided. It was quite apparent that the crew had been deceived into believing that the rising white terrain ahead was in fact quite flat and that it extended for many miles under the solid overcast. As a result of his investigation, Chippendale described the characteristics and the supposed atmospheric causes of this visual phenomenon in his final report. Specifically, he described whiteout as an atmospheric effect which results in loss of depth perception and is especially common in polar regions where there is snow cover. Only two conditions are necessary to produce a whiteout, a diffused shadowless illumination and a monocolored white surface. Whiteout, it must be emphasized, is not associated with precipitation or fog or haze. The condition may occur in a crystal clear atmosphere or under a cloud ceiling with ample, comfortable light and in a visual field filled with trees, huts, oil drums and other small objects. In polar regions, these conditions occur frequently. Large, unbroken expanses of snow are illuminated by a sky overcast with dense, low stratus clouds that blot out all trace of surface texture or shadow and merge hollows and snow-covered objects into a flattened white background. In addition, cloud and sky may have the same apparent colour and horizon discrimination is lost and the ground plane disappears. Those who have not been exposed to whiteout are often sceptical about the inability of those who have experienced it to estimate distance under these conditions and to be aware of terrain changes and the separation of sky and earth. Despite Chippendale's inclusion of this material in his final report, ultimately he was of the opinion that it played no factor in the accident sequence. Man, however, was sceptical and thus set about researching the subject matter for himself. The reason for the disappearance of any deviation in ground level under whiteout conditions is considered by scientists to be due to a complex process of light diffusion. The theory is that a large percentage of the light which penetrates the cloud cover is reflected back from the ground because it strikes the myriads of ice mirrors formed by the ice crystals which are tilted in all directions on the surface of the snow. The light rays are thus deflected upwards and meet the white undersurface of the cloud and then reflected back again. This process of transmission and reflection is believed to be the reason why the forward vista of a uniform white surface, even though quite plainly visible in crystal clear air, will appear uniformly flat, even though the terrain may be undulating or tilting upwards on a steadily rising plane. There have been occasions when this spectacular illusion will prevail even though the foreground as indicated in the previously quoted extract, contains small dark coloured objects. But without doubt, the illusion becomes totally deceptive when there are no dark points in the foreground to afford elements of contrast. Under such conditions, aircraft accidents in polar regions and in snow-covered terrain are commonplace. Indeed, from 1946 to 1973, there were in this period a total of 50 aircraft losses in Antarctica, and in a large proportion of cases, these casualties were attributed to loss of horizon or ground definition caused by this specific type of whiteout phenomenon. There were, of course, in addition to the 50 lost aircraft, a great many more incidents of which aircraft were badly damaged. In fact, it was estimated that in Antarctica between 1950 and 1960, whiteout was a contributory factor in 40% of the 25 flying accidents which occurred during the period. Likewise, in Canada, during the snow-covered months, probably 8 to 10 crashes per annum are in part or completely due to whiteout, with a further 4 to 5 cases per annum of aircraft damage being attributed to the same phenomenon.
Where there is a solid layer of overcast and snow-covered terrain ahead, the only effective protection against inability to detect rising terrain would be some large and distinctive dark landmark of either artificial construction or of natural geographical occurrence. In such a case, the pilot would then have a point of reference, which will often, though not always, indicate to him that the apparently flat white ground extending far ahead is in reality on a different plane from what it appears to be. In the case of the approach to Mount Erebus, there were three possible landmarks which were black in colour and which would have stood out as points of contrast against the broad white slopes of snow which ran upwards towards the peak of the mountain. These points of contrast all consist of areas of black volcanic rock. They are firstly the narrow strip of black rock which appears towards the bottom of the 300 foot ice cliff which marks the beginning of the rising snow slope. They represent areas of rock not covered by the layer of thick glacial ice which covers the whole of the lower slopes of the mountain. Secondly, the rocky outcrop situated about 4,000 feet above sea level to the right of the direct approach to the mountain peak. And thirdly, the broad exposed rock of Fan Ridge located not far down from the mountain peak itself. Of the three potential sightings as 901 approached Erebus, only the narrow strip of rock at the bottom of the ice cliff would have been visible. The overcast was well below the 4,000 foot level of the black outcrop to the left of the aircraft's approach, and of course Fang Ridge, along with the whole of the mountain above two to 3,000 feet, was totally obscured. Man in his summation had to be convinced in his own mind as to whether or not the conditions for whiteout actually existed at the time of the accident, and on balance, he was of the opinion that they had. He was suspicious that the cloud formation at the time constituted a total overcast on the approach to Mount Erebus, with a base of 3,000 feet, which probably gradually descended to 2,000 feet or perhaps a little higher as it met the mountains, and seeing that no one on the flight deck ever saw the snow slopes into which the aircraft crashed, not even in the last few seconds with the aircraft flying in clear air. There could be only one conclusion. Taking a similar position to that of the lead investigator, the Director of Civil Aviation declined to accept that there had been any visual illusion at all, and likewise took the view that even if there had existed visual deception of some kind, it played no part in the occurrence of the disaster. In an effort to resolve the matter once and for all, Mahan was to make inquiries as to whether there were expert witnesses who could verify or explain the nature of the phenomenon, and who, once appraised of the cloud conditions surrounding Ross Island on the date in question, could give an opinion as to whether or not this highly dangerous visual illusion had in fact existed. It was established that there were three leading authorities on the subject in the United States and one in Canada. As the Commission was obliged in any event to travel to the United States to take depositions from the United States Navy personnel who had been at McMurdo Sound on the day of the disaster, it was arranged that these subject matter experts would also be interviewed during the course of their journey. In an effort to assist these specialists with their evaluations, Mahan presented them with a photograph of the McMurdo area taken by satellite less than an hour before the time of the crash. This photograph showed the location of cloud formations and the approximate altitude of such formations. In addition, there was evidence from Flight Lieutenant McLeod of the Royal New Zealand Air Force, who had flown by helicopter from Victoria Land across to McMurdo Station during the late morning of the day in question, and who was able to describe the extent of the cloud cover over Ross Island and the approximate base of the overcast. There was also evidence in the form of a statement from pilots of two United States aircraft which had been approaching McMurdo Station from the True North and True South respectively not long before the occurrence of the crash. These two pilots were able to give a description of cloud formation and cloud layers both north and south of McMurdo Sound. Evidence also existed from Mr. J. S. Hickman who was meteorologist employed by the Meteorological Service, which formed part of the New Zealand Ministry of Transport. He had previously visited Antarctica and is a member of two organisations devoted to scientific research in the Ross Dependency area. Mr Hickman not only gave technical information as to weather forecasting in general in the Ross Sea area, but he also gave his opinion as to the weather prevailing to the true north of Ross Island 
as revealed by the passengers' photographs. These same photographs taken during the last two to three minutes and up until the last few seconds of the fatal flight were also made available. Mahan also had at his disposal a cloud formation chart drawn up by Mr M. R. Sinclair, who had been employed as a meteorologist with the New Zealand Meteorological Service and who, during each of the 1978-79 seasons, had been stationed at Scott Base as part of New Zealand Antarctic Research Programme. Part of his duties had been to conduct research studies of local weather in the McMurdo area. At the time of the disaster, he had been at Vanda Station in the Wright Valley, about 130 kilometres to the west of the crash site. Over time, he was able to reconstruct a most valuable cartographic profile of the position of various shallow cloud layers in the general location of the two descending orbits of the DC-10. His cloud profile indicated scattered thin cloud layers 50 miles out from McMurdo Station, wide breaks in cloud between 60 and 25 miles from the station, and then a continuous cloud layer over Ross Island from about 10 miles to the north of Mount Erebus. Other evidence which was able to help the specialist team were the CVR transcripts. In addition, there was also evidence provided by Professor R.H. Day, who since 1965 had been the Foundation Professor of Psychology at Monash University, Australia. His area of expertise was in the field of human perception, being recognised as a world authority on the matter. Professor Day made a close study of the Chief Inspector's report and made himself familiar with the known factual aspects of the disaster. In the course of his studies relating to the disaster, he discussed all aspects with Dr. J.C. Lane, who is the Director of Aviation Medicine, Department of Transport, Commonwealth of Australia, and regarded as one of the world's authorities on human factors in relation to air accident causation. Dr. Lane authorised Professor Day to say that he concurred with Professor Day's proposed evidence. In Professor Day's opinion, it was apparent from a study of the passenger's photographs and Mr. Sinclair's evidence regarding meteorological conditions that the necessary conditions for the occurrence of the whiteout phenomenon had, in fact, existed, and he was satisfied that loss of depth perception and lower threshold contrast existed throughout the final period of the flight. He had this to say as part of his evidence. It cannot be emphasised too strongly that the effects of whiteout are insidious in the extreme. Even on the ground, the effects are not recognised by the affected individual until a gross error has been made, such as walking into a snowbank or falling into a hole. The effect occurs quite rapidly under the conditions of intense light stimulation and white surfaces above and below. There's no way of knowing that the visual system is grossly affected until an untoward event occurs. It seems to me that the conditions which existed during the final stages of the flight were sufficient to produce a significant degree of visual impairment when looking ahead from the cockpit. Professor Day then paid particular regard to what he termed as the mental set of the individual who is confronted by the components of visual perception. He considered all the evidence, in particular the misleading track diagrams, which suggested that the crew of Air New Zealand 901 believed that the nav track was taking them down the centre of McMurdo Sound. He came to the conclusion, having regard to the topographical situation which existed, that a concerted belief on the part of the air crew, reached on the basis of the flight documents in question, and by reliance upon the false waypoints, would have overcome any minor features of the view ahead which otherwise might have raised doubts as to whether the aircraft in fact was upon the supposed course. In summary, therefore, his view was that the level of efficiency of the visual system of each member of the flight crew was probably markedly degraded through whiteout phenomena, that is to say, the high-intensity stimulation of rebounding light between the white land surface and the cloud above. The main consequence of this impaired visual efficiency would have been loss of contrast sensitivity and greatly impaired depth or distance perception. In conclusion, therefore, although Professor Day recognised that the whiteout phenomenon might alone account for the failure to ascertain the presence of rising terrain, he placed great emphasis upon the audiovisual briefing and upon the flight documentation as being a system failure on the part of the airline, which played a decisive part in accentuating loss of contrast sensitivity, as revealed by the failure of the flight crew to ascertain that the white expanse of ground in front of them was not on a flat plane as it seemed to be. 
the professor pointed out that the strongest evidence in support of the part played by the mental set was that it was not the visual perceptual system of a single member of the flight crew which had failed, but that of five persons, including an experienced Antarctic observer and commentator. The total of this evidence was displayed to each of the expert witnesses whom Mahan saw. The first witness was Dr. J. E. Goodson of the United States Navy base at Pensacola, Florida. Dr. Goodson had 20 years experience in the study of vision as a psychiatric psychologist and had made a close study of visual perception. His opinion was that upon looking at the rising snow slope on this occasion, with the sun behind and total cloud cover above, a pilot could think that he was perceiving an expanse of level ice or snow running forward for perhaps 40 miles. Without texture or contour to guide him, he would perceive the limits of his visual field as being far in the distance rather than close in. Captain Philip Briscoe was also interviewed at Pensacola. He was a flight surgeon and chief ophthalmologist at the Pensacola base. He was also a naval aviator with over 2,000 hours spent mainly on fighters. Captain Briscoe, having studied all the relevant material, was of the opinion that if Captain Collins had believed that he was overflying the sea ice in McMurdo Sound and that he had in front of him 40 miles of flat ice and snow, then having regard to the weather conditions, he would have believed himself to be seeing those conditions as he flew under the overcast towards the snow-covered approach to Mount Erebus. The next expert Mahan saw was Captain Ginsburg, who was stationed at the Wright-Patterson Airfield, Dayton, Ohio. Ginsburg was a consultant to the United States Air Force on the topic of visual phenomena and was awarded a doctorate in philosophy by the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom for his published work in the field. His special field of interest was that of contrast sensitivity which exists as a function of sight. Mann presented to Ginsburg the evidence to date in relation to the expected weather over the crash site at the time of the accident and Ginsburg proceeded to make himself completely familiar with the file's content. He was also asked to take into account, but only as an hypothesis, that Captain Collins had flown on that track southwards from Cape Hallett until orbiting through a cloud break and had armed the nav track again as the last orbit concluded because of his belief that the nav track would lead the aircraft down the centre of McMurdo Sound with many miles of flat sea or ice on either side. Mahan subsequently paraphrased Ginsburg's testimony as follows. Ginsburg deferred his consideration of this latter evidence, suggesting Captain Collins believed that by maintaining the nav track he would be keeping the aircraft many miles away from any high ground. Instead, he concentrated his attention upon what Collins and Casson were likely to have seen at the conclusion of the second orbit, when the plane was locked back onto nav track as it approached Ross Island. In his opinion, having regard to the known height of the overcast, which, judging by the passengers' photographs, was still well above the aircraft at the moment when it struck the mountainside, and having regard to the position of the sun and its 34 degree inclination, then the pilot would have seen a white expanse of flat terrain extending forwards for an unlimited distance. His point of visual reference would only have been the shallow strips of black rock some miles to the left and some miles to the right of the aircraft, representing Cape Tennyson and Cape Bird. Looking forward, there would be no points of reference over the ice and snow. Not only would there be no points of contrast, but there would be no perception of depth. The fact that the flat white carpet in front was in fact rising upwards at an inclination of 13 degrees and then 19 degrees before meeting the overcast would not be perceived. There would be no shadows and no points of reference of terrain in a forward direction and Ginsburg expected that a pilot not familiar with this type of visual illusion would merely fly straight on. Mahan referred to the undisputed evidence that no one on the flight deck ever saw the snow-covered slopes into which the aircraft flew. Ginsburg said that this was not a surprising feature at all, and indeed he would expect, in the conditions prevailing, that no one on the flight deck, even flying in clear air, would detect that the aircraft was about to strike a rising expanse of white terrain. He said that the only pilot or pilots who would suspect that ocular phenomena would be people who had flown in polar regions before. He said that pilots with Arctic or Antarctic experience would also not see the mountainside, but having noted the overcast would be aware that there might be something in front of them which they couldn't see. 
the two or three pieces of rock face in the ice cliff directly ahead of the aircraft would not be identified as anything but thin black strips of sea of the type previously encountered while the aircraft was flying over floating pack ice a minute or so previously. Maham then asked Ginsburg to consider the factor previously mentioned, namely that the pilot may have believed himself to be flying over a very wide expanse of flat ice in the approximate centre of McMurdo Sound. Having studied the maps, Ginsburg expressed the opinion that the two thin strips of dark rock to the left and right of the approach to Lewis Bay would coincide, in the pilot's opinion, with the entrance to McMurdo Sound, and if the captain's nav track confirmed the pilot's belief that he was in the centre of McMurdo Sound, then the totality of the illusion would be complete. He said that the pilot, upon levelling out after the second orbit, and upon looking far ahead along the flat white surface, would be expecting to see the high terrain 20 to 30 miles away, which lies approximately to the true south of the head of the sound. And when he couldn't see it, he no doubt decided that it was safer to climb away. Overall, therefore, Ginsburg was thus of the opinion that the absence of depth and contrast definitions would have produced what he described as a characteristic example of total visual deception. Ginsburg placed very considerable emphasis on the same point as had been made by Professor Day, namely that everything turns on the mental precondition of an observer. He stressed that the eye is not a camera. He said that the observation of a particular object necessarily requires a combination of the function of sight with the function of mental activity associated with the process of observation. Discrepancies between what appears to be seen and what is known to be visible are automatically cancelled out by the mind in favour of a picture of what is known to be there. If Captain Collins believed on various grounds that he was flying down the approximate centre of McMurdo Sound, then he would, as a necessary function of his intellect, relate whatever he saw to what he expected to see, and would coordinate objective and subjective perception. But this would only occur if he was certain of his position. If he were in any way uncertain of his position, then his subjective perception would be disengaged, so to speak, and he would be guided by visual perception alone. If certain of his position and his course, he would automatically discount minor variations in the visual perception as opposed to what he expected to see, but only up to a certain limit of tolerance. That is to say, if visual perception suddenly appeared to present a picture which was markedly different in some respect from his expected observation, then that fact would intrude upon the precondition of certainty of position and, for the first time, a state of mental uncertainty would arise as to whether he was, in fact, upon the course or in the position previously assumed. In this respect, according to Ginsburg, the similarity in the approach to Lewis Bay and the approach to the head of McMurdo Sound had constantly to be borne in mind because, judging from the passenger's photographs, it was in all probability a factor confirming the mental set of Captain Collins that he was certainly in the centre of McMurdo Sound. It seemed clear from the passengers' photographs that the tip of Cape Tennyson, as seen from an approach to Lewis Bay, and the tip of Cape Bird, as seen from the same position, each revealed a very shallow line of black rock surrounded by snow. If the appearance of Cape Bird from the centre of the Sound also presented a narrow strip of black rock at sea level, and if Cape Bernacci presented a similar picture, then the inequalities of distance wouldn't matter there will not be any sufficiently obtruding difference from the expected vision sufficient to cause any doubt to arise. On the 10th of November 1980, Mahan visited Farnborough in the UK and having listened to a reproduction of extracts from the cockpit voice recorder tape, it was suggested that he meet with a Mr Roger Green who was a psychologist employed in a civil capacity with the Royal Air Force as a specialist in flight skills, including visual illusion. His attendance is required at about one third of the boards of inquiry held by the Royal Air Force, involving incidents in which the presence of human factors appears to have been an operative cause. Green laid stress upon the guides provided by visual cues and emphasised the point that without visual cues, the factors of depth and contrast substantially disappear. 
In snow-covered terrain, a pilot is deprived of texture information which will alone equate him with slope and distance. In bright sunshine, he is only deprived of that information to a partial extent, but even so, his normal appreciation of variation in terrain is adversely affected. Green also stressed the importance of the mental set of a pilot and believed that the comparison between Lewis Bay and the approach to McMurdo Sound was a good example. The third of the experts whom Mahan was advised to see was Mr. G.W. Shannon, Vice President of Operations for Bradley Air Services Limited of Ontario, Canada. Shannon's company flew both passengers and freight schedules up to North Canada and the Subarctic. He was also retained some years ago to carry out a commercial contract in Antarctica. He flew from the southernmost point of South America across to Shackleton Basin, Antarctica, and then across the polar continent to McMurdo. This flight and other operations in the Antarctic were carried out in a de Havilland Twin Otter, that work being connected with the operations of a United States drilling site. He was reasonably familiar with the McMurdo region and was recommended as being an expert whose knowledge and experience of flying in snow conditions was exceptional. Mahan subsequently met Shannon at his company's location at Nipeen, some miles outside of Ottawa. He had the advantage of having no prior knowledge of the DC-10 disaster, except that he naturally knew of the occurrence. He had not read the Chief Inspector's report and had no detailed knowledge of the circumstances. Over a period of between two to three hours, Mahan shared with Shannon all the relevant maps and diagrams, weather information, cloud location, passengers' photographs and so forth. He also showed him the Chief Inspector's transcription of the cockpit voice recorder. Shannon noted all this material and paid close attention to the cockpit voice recorder transcript, which he read and reread on a number of occasions, particularly the closing stages. In his opinion, the prevailing weather and the location of the sun would present to the crew of the DC-10 a forward vista of flat snow and ice extending far away into the distance. That being the case, he strongly suspected that a pilot unfamiliar with polar conditions would believe that he was flying forward with clear visibility over flat terrain for many miles. Collins and Casson would have been two such pilots, having no previous Antarctic flying experience. So while believing they were looking at a flat landscape with clearly visible terrain definition, the truth, however, was that the environment surrounding the aircraft had rendered the topography completely featureless. Mahan also asked Shannon whether the overcast extending forward would form an illusionary horizon in the distance at a point where it met the snow-covered rising ground. Shannon said he thought not. He said that in such conditions, the almost invariable effect is that the underside of the overcast turns white so that there would be no horizon at all. He said that there was a possibility of a false horizon, but he regarded that possibility as remote. His own years of experience of flying in such conditions led him to the conclusion that the overcast in front of the pilot would seem to disappear by reason of the fact that its grey undersurface would become white in colour through the multiple light reflection provided by overhead sun from behind the aircraft. Shannon gave an example of an occurrence which often takes place at their own airport when the ground is covered with snow. He said that if there is a light overcast overhead, then in daylight the underside of the overcast turns white and it's impossible from the ground to discern the height of the cloud layer. He said you know the overcast is there because you can't see the sun, but it is not possible to say whether the overcast is 1500 feet high or 5000 feet high when looking upward from the ground. He also stated that having regard to the known weather conditions at the time of the accident, he would expect that as Captain Collins levelled out following the second orbit and having dropped in altitude to 1500 feet to try and see something in the distance but without success, that Captain Collins would then have elected to climb away because he could not see any landmarks in the distance. He noted from his study of the cockpit voice recorder transcript that Collins decided very soon after having levelled out that he should climb away and he attributed that decision to the fact that although the aircraft was flying under the overcast and although the ground seemed to stretch away for miles, nevertheless there was no terrain anywhere to be seen. As with other expert witnesses with whom Mahan had met, 
Shannon placed huge significance upon the adherence of Captain Collins to the inertial navigation track. He said that if Collins had plotted the nav track on a map, then he would obviously have believed that there was no danger of any kind ahead, and that he was many miles away from any high ground. He was of the opinion that one of the reasons why he had studied and restudied the closing stages of the transcript was to try and see whether there was any expressed concern or doubt on the part of Collins or Casson in relation to the course or position of the aircraft, being largely uninterested in the crosstalk which was taking place behind them. He said he had drawn the conclusion that neither Collins nor Casson had entertained the slightest apprehension at any stage and he thus drew the further conclusion that each of them was perfectly satisfied as to the course and position of the aircraft. Put to Shannon the theory that a pale fog may have drifted off the ice and covered the ice cliff, he responded by saying that the winds in the area are very fickle, and even a temporary breeze from the true north would instantly form ice fog the moment it reached the ice shelf below the cliff. The fog might persist with a steady breeze, climbing upwards, but if the breeze died away, then the fog would disperse. He also stated that if there were patches of black rock visible forward of the aircraft on that part of the ice cliff not covered by glacial ice, then this would have been of no significance to Collins and Casson as, from a distance, any shallow patches of black rock would merely resemble the patches of black water which they had previously observed. Shannon stated that the situation confronting Collins as he levelled out after the second orbit would have signalled a red light to the experienced Antarctic flyer, who would immediately have flown away. One of the last passenger's photographs had illustrated that the weather ahead was getting more solid, and in his opinion, any experienced pilot would have realised that conditions were no longer appropriate for visual flying. But in highlighting this fact, he again emphasised that Collins, despite his Antarctic inexperience, had only taken a brief interval to independently reach this conclusion for himself. He had then attempted to fly away once he could not discern the clear visibility which Max Centre had told him would be apparent once he had descended to 2,000 feet. Therefore, having methodically worked through the evidence in front of him, with the considered thoughts and opinions of his subject matter experts, Mahan was now more convinced than ever that he had come to understand the mysteries surrounding those last few moments on the flight deck of the DC-10. None of the five individuals present had seen Erebus, because it simply wasn't there to be seen. <laughs>